So welcome again, everybody. Um, in these general interest webinars, what we do is we present topics uh, that staff find to be uh, of particular use to users uh, that are doing research on the SharkNet systems and now the national systems. A lot of these topics, we do them every two weeks, uh, range from you know, presenting on specific software or, or strategies for optimization. What we decided to do this week is present on the scheduler that's running on the new national systems. In the last couple of weeks, some very large general purpose national systems came into play with a lot of resources. There's some documentation on how to schedule jobs on these new systems, but what we really want to focus on today is basically how the scheduler receives those resource requests in the job and then dispatches them to run on the clusters. Now, understanding this uh, procedure where a queue job goes from being in the queue to uh, being in the running state, uh, understanding at a certain level will allow you to submit the jobs in ways that might reduce your queue time um, and, and also give you a better understanding of, of the utilization of the system as an overview of this pres presentation, I'll be going over some documentation uh, as well as getting help on the topic of how jobs can get to the run state once they're scheduled on the system. The main topics that I'll be uh, presenting and, and demonstrating are really uh, some scheduling basics. So, you know, what are the node resources and resource requests? So a resource request is basically the job, and, so, and what do we put into these requests, and how does that correspond to the actual hardware and software that's running on the system? The next thing is the job queue basics. So I'll be talking about factors that affect the order of jobs in the queue, and we're basically talking about the priority of the jobs. Now, whenever we're submitting a job to the scheduler, uh, there are several of these jobs in the scheduler, often uh, more jobs requesting more resources than can be satisfied at any time by the scheduler. So those are queued and wait for resources to become available. But the order of that queue is uh, changed based on priority of the job, and there are many factors that go into the ordering of the priority, and I'll describe that then. Then we'll talk about the cluster resource basics. So part of what affects the priority of the queue jobs is really the categorization of resources um, that affect priority. So these are partitions. How do we categorize properties of the system so that jobs requiring certain resources get the chance to run, um, also allowing um, jobs to fill gaps when utilization stays very high? So once I go over these, these, um, these general topics about how jobs that are in the queue uh, get over to the running state, then we'll just go over a, a couple topics on actually monitoring things. So monitoring jobs, whether they're in the queue or running, um, monitoring the queue, so understanding the actual state of the queue is important for determining how long your jobs might be there, how good the system is working, et cetera. And also uh, monitoring the cluster itself. How busy uh, is the cluster with running jobs, allocations, and what's idle, et cetera. So just to get started, I'll go over some documentation. Basically, the scheduler that we're using implemented there is the Slurm scheduler. You can find all kinds of documentation uh, for this online, and we've got the links here. Um, and there's also a brief link to the uh, a two-page uh, cheat sheet with a bunch of the Slurm scheduler commands. The Slurm scheduler commands go beyond just giving you tools for submitting jobs, but also give you tools for monitoring the jobs, the queue, and the system itself. And we can go over those a little bit. Every system that uses Slurm is configured to run in a specific way, and this is very um, customizable. So this depends on the hardware that's on the actual systems. The documentation for the specific systems we're going to be talking about today, you can find at docs.computecanada.ca. Each of the systems we'll be talking about, in this case the general purpose systems, Graham and Cedar, have their own pages. This is where you'd be expected to go to find the actual node layout of the resources that are available on those systems. 
you'll also find links to running jobs. Um, this is basically a prerequisite to a presentation like this one where you get the instructions on how to submit a job to the scheduler. Uh, this presentation will mainly focus on how that job goes from being scheduled to running. That also links to a job scheduling policies. The job scheduling policies is really what we're going to be talking about today. The job scheduling policy is basically how a, schedule, or a, a queued job is sorted in the queue, so basically the priority of the job, and then allowed to run on the resources that are available in the system. Now, the configuration of the scheduling policy is an active configuration where we'll be trying to uh, keep up with what's happening, the types of loads that are on the system, and uh, we'll be modifying that procedure so that it is optimizing both the, the, uh, the usage of the system as well as the performance of, of jobs and making sure that high performance jobs are allowed to, to work in an environment that, that best suits them. Whenever there is an issue with the configuration of the scheduler uh, that will affect the, the queue times or the running of jobs, uh, this will be listed in the known issues at docs.computecanada.ca. Other prerequisites for this, if you just want to get more information about how to run jobs and what the total environment, you can go to the Compute Canada YouTube uh, page and there's an introduction playlist there. At that page, you'll find all kinds of information, uh, brief uh, videos on, on running jobs and, and monitoring the system. Now, importantly, I'll bring this up a few times, you can always contact us at support uh, at computecanada.ca. So basically, what I'm going to get to today is with, with all the new resources that are coming online uh, just within the last couple of weeks, um, all together the researchers and the staff and the hardware have entered in probably the most complicated Tetris game um, that's ever existed. And probably the most important one as the, the success of the, the uh, getting jobs to fit tightly together um, and keeping the system fully running results in very high impact research is important in many fields. Now, what I'll be talking about today is the, the, the Tetris game where we basically have these shapes that we're trying to fit into a space with as few gaps as possible um, is, the, is the game. Now, it's the schedule that's actually playing that game. The researchers, whenever they submit jobs, are requesting basically a shape that needs to fit onto the system. The queue is the list of shapes that need to fit into the system. The scheduler takes those shapes, orders them so that there's fair usage as much as possible, and then tries to fit them as tightly into the available resources as possible. Now, what staff are doing is we're manipulating the way that Slurm takes those jobs and submits them uh, and gets them running. But importantly, there needs to be a discussion between the researchers and the people doing the configuration of the system to make sure that the types of loads that are on the system are getting to run as quickly as possible and that we maximize the total utilization of the system. So getting into some basics um, of scheduling, the node resources and the resource requests. So let's just start talking about the job queue. This is a basic illustration of, let's say, a single node. In this single node, there are resources. I've listed a couple here. There are cores and memory. I'll list those at the top ones right now because those are the ones that I'm going to be focusing on whenever I'm talking about the shape of a job. I say, et cetera, et cetera. So there might be some more very important ones. For example, some nodes have GPUs. Some have limited software licenses that we need to monitor as resources, et cetera, et cetera, other things. And then all of this is a resource that's available uh, for time. So in this image, I'm listing cores. In this case, there are 10 cores, one, two, three, et cetera. And then there's the memory. The memory is shared across the cores in a node. And what I've listed here is basically the total memory for all of these cores uh, during this given time period. 
And then what we see here is that there's basically overhead. So in this case, if the total, um, there are 10 cores on this node, and if the total memory that's available to be shared between these is 10, you can assume that there's actually a little bit taken up by overhead on each of the nodes. And then we have time. So this one indicating that one of these cubes is, is one hour of time. And that time moves forward going up. Now, once we have these resources laid out in this way that we can visualize, basically we have a certain number of, of cores in this node. We have a certain amount of memory that's available to be shared across those nodes. Then what the scheduler does is it goes through scheduling cycles. At a certain point in time, it checks to see what resource requests are in the job list, and then it tries to fit them into the, onto the system to run. The scheduling cycle is the period of time that does this. So let's take a look at, at what a job size actually is. Here on the right, we have a list of jobs. The jobs are requests for resources that basically have a shape. In this case, I'll be talking about time and memory and uh, the number of, of cores. So it's actually a three-dimensional shape. Right now, these are all rectangular. That for the duration of a job, the request of memory and the number of CPUs is constant. And then these are basically in a list. Let's say that this is the, the job that was submitted first. It's requesting one hour of time and one gig of memory. The next job that was submitted is requesting six uh, hours, and the memory is eight gigs. And then the CPUs per task is eight. So this is a threaded job for eight hours across eight cores. Now, at this scheduling cycle right now on this first hour, we can see that the first job fits on the resources that are available. And we see down in the bottom right corner that that job goes into the running state. It fits onto the hardware described in this node. Also, the second job in the queue is able to start as it requires eight CPUs, and there are still nine available. The memory that it requests is eight gigs, and there are still eight gigs available. Let's say there's one gig overhead, and then there are uh, there's one gig taken up by the previous serial job. So the shape of these jobs is based on the number of cores in this case, the amount of memory, as well as the amount of time. Now, the next job listed in this queue, and just in the chronological order, is requesting one hour, the number of tasks is eight, and then the memory per CPU is 400, and in this case is defaulting to megs. Now this is an MPI job that is not limited to um, operating on a single core. Now, because there is no memory left in this first hour, this job cannot start right now, and so it waits. But what happens is, as the scheduling cycle moves forward, and during the next hour, this job is allowed to start as it takes up a core here, a core here, and because it's an MPI job that can spread across uh, nodes, the other processes uh, are on different nodes and that can continue out somewhere else. Now, at this time again, all of the cores are used up and all of the memory. This is full utilization of the node. So at this time, it is not possible for anything else to start. This scheduling cycle doesn't need to look any further because the node is at full utilization, so the next job definitely can't start. The next job in the queue is asking for two hours and nine gigs of memory. Now, this two hour nine gigs of memory will not be able to start until these jobs are finished on this node because there's not enough memory left. But once the scheduling cycle gets over here, this job is able to start. It's a serial job taking up all of the memory on the node. In this case, the scheduler cannot schedule more jobs because there's no memory left. But the actual utilization of the node is very low, where there are now nine cores sitting idle.
this time there's still another job in the queue. In this case, it's asking for one hour. The nodes it's asking for is one, and the tasks per node is 10, with the memory per process at 400. Now, this is an MPI job like we saw above, except in this case, the uh, tasks per node, there's a typo there, there shouldn't be a dash, is 10. So this MPI job is being forced to be a full node job. This one cannot start until the serial 9 gig job begins once the scheduling cycle gets here. Now what we see is this is considered a full utilization uh, of the node. All the CPUs are taken up, even though there's some memory available. Now, the job size is very important. Is this, you know, the job size is really what constrains um, uh, the procedure to start running. The scheduler needs to find the space somewhere on the cluster to fit the size of a job. And the size of the job has several dimensions. Now, another thing is whenever we get into later how the priority uh, or fair share of a job works, there's basically a billing involved. The job billing is basically the, the cost in terms of, of, of your, your fair share priority of running certain jobs. Now, billing is done by cores, so you're basically, you have a target uh, core usage. But the other thing is that because core usage does not fully represent the, the uh, total utilization that you're consuming, it's done by core and memory. So, for example, the first job, the billing is basically one core. It runs on one core, and it's using one core's worth of memory. The second job is billing eight cores. It's using eight cores at each, at each time in its, its scheduling cycle. And it's also using about eight cores worth of memory. The third job is an MPI job that runs across node. It's using eight cores and is costing eight cores. But what we see is here is a big difference in this fourth job where the utilization is very low uh, and restricted on the node, that this job is being billed for nine cores. It's only using a single core, but it's using nine cores worth of memory and the equivalents. And then similarly, although the fifth job is not using all of the memory or the, the 10 cores worth of memory, it is actually using 10 cores. So in this case, the billing is the largest of the two resources that determines the availability of other resources on that node. Now, the billing will come into play whenever we talk about the fair share priority shortly. Now, whenever we're talking about job shape, this, this is, uh, you know, the main thing to understand whenever you're submitting jobs is that a job by default will have a rectangular shape. But many procedures that we run in research, uh, typically in my research with long pipelines, the actual memory demands on a long job will have spikes in it. Now, rather than requesting the memory for the entire duration, we can actually break the job up into dependencies. This ability to change the shape from being rectangular to a more uh, a flexible shape of a job is important, uh, both in terms of, of work being able to fit into the cluster more easily, but also in terms of the actual utilization of the system. So, for example, uh, submitting a procedure where uh, including dependencies would be appropriate. Here I have job one that's basically asking for four hours with four gigs of memory throughout the job. We get this green job here that runs for four hours on a single core, and then it takes up these four gigs of memory for the entire duration. Now, that's the allocation of this work. It takes up this entire memory allocation. Even though we might know that during the middle two hours, it's only using half the amount of memory. These uh, gigs of memory that are available on the system, because the job was submitted as constant four gigs, 
are unused but allocated to the job. Now, whenever properties like this are known on the system, what we can do is we can get the exact same type of work done, except submit it as three separate jobs and then have them be dependent on each other. The way that we would do that is we would submit this job two, which is one hour where it requires the full four gigs of memory. That's the dark yellow one down at the bottom. We can start right away. Then we submit job three. Job three is two hours long and only requires two gigs of memory. And its dependency is after OK of job two. And then once that one is complete, another four gig job can start uh, dependent on the completion of three. And then here we see that the actual job shape resembles the utilization. Now there are other benefits if this is appropriate for your work in that these smaller jobs can fit into smaller spaces of available resources and that the dependently queued jobs that will start soon after the completion of their dependency can be divided by jobs in time and these fit much better into a complex um, job scheme. So now this is basically the, the overview of how jobs are shaped and uh, what we're looking at. We're going to go over a couple more job shapes later. But the next thing that I want to talk about is we've been looking at jobs being in queue, basically uh, in a chronological order or a first in, first out basis. But the truth is that once jobs end up in the queue, they get resorted based on priority. So now we're going to talk about the job queue basics and the factors that affect the order of jobs in the queue and the priority. Now we talked about job size. The shape of requested resources affects the priority and we'll go over how that happens. The age of a job, and basically whenever we're looking at it in the chronological order, left alone, uh, the, that duration in the queue also affects, affects its priority. And if it's the first in, first out, this is the only factor. Now, what we're really going to be focusing on now that we've looked at the job size and basically the, the age of jobs in the queue, of the, the chronological order, what we want to do is look at these major factors that determine the actual ordering of jobs in the queue. Fair share is uh, the main one. Understanding fair share also gives us access to really understanding the difference between resource allocations, in this case the, resource, the resources for research groups, uh, RRG, versus the uh, rapid access service, uh, RAS, um, that we've been defining for users. Fair share is an account's past usage effect on the priority of queued jobs. So your usage, the billing that we were talking about briefly before, affects where your jobs end up in the queue once they get resorted. And then finally, there are partitions. Partitions are the classification of node sets. And this interacts with job size in determining the priority of the job. So what we can do on these systems is, you know, although there are many types of nodes, even among nodes that have the same properties, we can include partitions that classify nodes that will favor jobs that fit certain size parameters. And then we'll go over that. Factors that affect the order of jobs in a queue. Basically, what we were looking at before with this filling up example of a node um, that has different uh, levels of utilization uh, and different shape of jobs is that, you know, by default, the first in, first out is the chronological order of uh, the jobs or resource, or resource requests that came into the queue. Now, what we want to talk about next is how the fair share tree will reorganize the order of the queue so that at each scheduling cycle, the uh, scheduler starts at the top and moves down whenever it's trying to fit jobs into the resources. So the fair share tree, basically each account has a usage share target. This usage share target is really you know, defined by the actual uh, uh, usage of the system. In this case, we'll just call it course. The fair share value ranges between 0 and 1. 
where 5 or 0.5 indicates that usage is on par with the target. And then moves towards 0. Uh, it indicates that usage is ahead of the target. So you've actually been uh, using more of the system than uh, your target states. And then towards 1 indicates that usage is behind target. So if you haven't been getting jobs in, your fair share value between 0 and 1 increases. Now, this fair share, fair share value between 0 and 1 is used in an algorithm to determine uh, the priority of your job. The priority of your job determines where it ends up from top to bottom uh, as the sequence at which the scheduler checks that job um, for uh, the ability to run it. As an example, let's say we happen to have these perfect numbers of 10 accounts with equal shares of 1. Okay? This equal shares of 1 for 10 accounts basically fits that each account is expected to maintain one core usage over time for good. Okay? That's really the definition of the, the, the share value in this case. There are 10 shares in total, which in this case translates exactly to the number of cores, and each account on this core or user is given the share of one. So in this case, although shares can be arbitrary numbers, it's really the, the percentage of the resources that you have access to. In this case, each of these accounts, accounts 1 through 10, are expected to maintain one core usage over time. Fair share adjustments and then the fair share inclusion in the calculation of a job's priority aims to maintain the usage at one core over time. So here's an example. Let's say at the scheduling cycle one, all the users submit a job. Each one of these users currently has a fair share of 0.5. At this point, they're currently at their target. This way, all of the jobs get in. There are 10 resources available. They're all expected to get one core. And in this case, they all get one core. They each have a job that starts. Let's say on the next scheduling cycle, account number one gets two jobs in, account number two gets two jobs in, and the accounts five through 10 each get one core's worth in but accounts three and four don't get any jobs in. So we see it just happened that these are the users that submitted jobs that were available during this scheduling cycle, and those are the jobs that got in. A1, A2 each get two cores worth, and A5 through 10 get one cores worth. Now, let's just say that prior, uh, leading up to the next scheduling cycle, like the first scheduling cycle, each of the accounts submits one core's worth of jobs. Now, the ordering is not sequential, it's not arbitrary, it's determined by the fair share value. In this case, the fair share value for accounts three and four have gone up towards one. That means that in the equation, their fair share will push these jobs up to the top of the queue. That is, in this case, now that there's a difference between the actual usage across the users, where users three and four have fallen behind their fair share target, these are the jobs that are going to be considered first by the scheduler for submission. Accounts five through 10 stay the same as they've been maintaining their target where they have had one core running for the past two cycles. And then accounts one and two end up at the bottom. Now, this is assuming that fair share is basically the equation at this point. 
that the ordering of these jobs be considered by the scheduler is determined by their fair share. Now, in this case, if uh, users three and four had submit multiple jobs, they would be more likely to get in uh, than users one and two, even if they had submitted them and there were more jobs on the scheduling cycle um, than resources available. Now, this reordering of the queue for the consideration of the scheduler and putting jobs into running is a major part of, of how the scheduler works. Now, in terms of a fair share tree, in production shares are not equal. This is a very important part of the entire structure of how these massive shared resources between massive amounts of users are managed. Mainly in that resource allocations, for example, the resources for research groups, are defined by unique share targets. Whenever you apply for a resource allocation, you're specifying core years. This translates directly into a share value among the system. Now, this also helps us define exactly what the rapid access service is. And this is equal, RAS is the equally shared residual system resources beyond the allocation. Basically, resource allocations get shares the queues are always reordered to help those jobs stay on target for their allocation for that year. Anything that's left over beyond the allocations is available at an equal share to all users um, in default queues. Now, the basic layout of how the current national system works is that it was targeted to have the uh, allocations actually account for 80% of all the resources. Now here we're still looking at one node, but this would basically be that there is a resource for research group project one, two, three, and four. Each of these projects have their own unique share. The Q priority is going to be considering these jobs as submitted um, in a way that will keep all of this work on par to their allocation in terms of course. Now, within the research group, those are shared equally among the accounts in that group. But for the resource, you know, the rapid access server, it's shared equally among all default accounts. What we've been looking at so far has all been on a single node. But really, this work is done in the context of many, many nodes. Um, and what we want to do now is sort of look at what parts of the system beyond just the fair share also come into the equation for determining the order of the queue priority. And what we're going to be talking about now is partitions. How do we organize nodes on a system so that it interacts with the shape of the jobs in determining the order of the queue priority. So what I'm going to do here is basically just take this node that has 10 cores and 10 gigs of memory, and then we show it for a certain amount of time, fading off into the future, and then just put those 10 hours down into that one node that we see down in the bottom of the full cluster. So looking at you know, the cluster resource basics, the categorization of resources that affect the priority. So partitions allow for job uh, shapes to interact with priority on subsets of nodes. Now, there are basically you know, some hardware, wired, and, and uh, actual uh, physical properties that determine partitions. For example, we have some nodes that have GPUs, some nodes have uh, large memory, medium memory, and then we have some nodes that are reserved for interactive usage. So those are specialty nodes and they've been set aside for very specific purposes. And then we have a whole bunch of base nodes. Now these base nodes will say are all the same, same in terms of the actual hardware within them. But we want some of them to behave differently in terms of how uh, jobs will get scheduled in there. Some jobs, 
the, the, the size or shape of them are very hard to schedule. And we would want some nodes to be sensitive to that difficulty and schedule them and favor certain properties of jobs so that those jobs can get scheduled and researchers aren't tempted to submit jobs in a way that is not optimal to the schedule just to get it running. One of the dimensions to partition nodes is on the runtime. Short run times are very easy to fit into complex um, sort of job grids um, where there are small gaps here and there. So setting partitions based on different time intervals is a way of organizing jobs so that more difficult to schedule jobs have a more likely opportunity based on the reordering of the priorities. The reordering of the priorities in this case, giving a difficult job to schedule a higher priority, is useful particularly whenever backfilling is enabled. Backfilling is the running of lower priority jobs that can finish before any higher priority job can begin. On one of these partitions of the 12 hour uh, nodes, Jobs that run for uh, 12 hours or under are favored. Now jobs of three hours are also included in this and can run. What we have here is there's currently a big job running. It's been running for some time in the past and is at least a 12 hour job and it's going to end in four hours. The next job in the queue is a 12 hour job which fits this partition well. And it's a uh, 10 task threaded job that requires 8 gigs of memory and basically taking up the full node during its execution. This job is the next one in the queue. This one has the highest priority in this queue. A second job in the queue is also requesting two gigs of memory, but 12 hours. At this point, this job cannot start as it's below this one that is set to start in four hours, but it cannot finish or is not set to finish before this one begins. A job that may have been submitted at the same time or, or even after these other jobs that fit the 12 hour categorization is this three hour job at the bottom. The three hour job ends up at the bottom of the queue because in this partition, um, three hour jobs have a lower priority in the calculation. It ends up down there, but it's still allowed to start because it is only reserving three hours of time. This means that it can end, it's guaranteed to end, before a higher priority job begins. This backfilling is what we can enable by having different partitions in the case where these long jobs that are much harder to schedule still get a chance because they'll end up high in the priority, but these long jobs often leave big gaps of utilization in systems and difficult jobs to schedule typically do leave big gaps of utilization by allowing the smaller jobs to also be included in the longer job partitions at a lower priority, we can allow this sort of backfilling. And backfilling is an important part of, of utilization on these systems. Now, it's also, you can see that the, the amount of time that you request in your resources will affect the queue time if a short job is allowed to backfill in an entire cluster. Now, partitions can take several other steps as well. Another shape of a job is whether it's by node versus by core. So a by node job can perform better. Now, this is a job that uses an entire node. This means a couple of things. If it's communicating across the cores, um, we can expect that there are some benefits to communicating within a node uh, rather than outside of a node. But it's also the only job running on that core. For example, there are, might be bottlenecks with uh, writing and reading files across jobs interfering with each other. So by node jobs can perform better. 
by core jobs, that is a job that is just taking up portions of a single node or portions of multiple nodes, have more opportunity to run. So what we can do is we can create partitions that favor harder, more difficult jobs to run. In this case, we see that in these two MPI jobs, uh, let's say they're requesting three days, so they end up in this three-day partition. The first one is requesting one node, and the number of tasks per node is 10. This, in this case where we have these 10 core nodes, is a full node job and will have priority to run here. Now, without specifying the number of tasks per node or the node, we just specify a three-day number of tasks 10 MPI job. It can get distributed you know, across cores in a specific node and then across nodes and filling gaps in different places. This job favors the utilization of the system, whereas this job favors the performance. Now, importantly, what we want to get to at the end of this is saying that the research, the job shape should always be determined by the tested performance of a job. We've talked about all of the properties that affect uh, the systems. What we can do is whenever you're on the systems using Slurm to you know, not only submit jobs, uh, we can use it to monitor properties of things. I'm going to SSH quickly. Into okay, so I'm logged into this system. I'm going to go over to demo folder. And I was submitting jobs earlier, and the, the gram queue is, is very busy right now, so it might still be running. What I can do is once I've already started running jobs, I can use the sq command to list jobs that I have. And it has already ran. So what I'll do now is I have this, uh, this little script that submits uh, an octave job. And then I'm going to use a spatch to submit the job. And then I hear back that I didn't specify my user account, like I'm not used to doing it. So now I've submitted this job and I get the job ID. And what I can do is I can check on this. So this job will stay uh, pending for a while because the job queue is very busy. I can check details of it um, uh, in the queue if I just want to look at specific jobs. I can also look at states of the job. So using the sstat and then uh, the job ID, so in this case 63176. Um, this one will basically tell me a bunch of the the resources that it's going to report once it starts running, but there are currently no steps running, so we don't get anything about it. The sdat can be used to monitor the actual uh, utilization of the job, what resources is actually taken up beyond what's been allocated to it resource by the resource request. And then similarly, once a job is completed, you can use the sact uh, and then the job. You can also monitor the queue, for example, if you um, call uh, sq username, you'll see the job that you have in the queue. If you call sq and then just pipe it to less, you'll see all of the jobs in the queue with details about them. And then you can do other things. For example, you can use the information about jobs in the queue to try and determine um, Different, different properties about what's happening. This is useful in terms of uh, if you set the outputs, and this is basically when the job was submitted, this V and then S is when it actually started. What you can determine is in all of the queue based on you know other properties of the jobs, like how much memory it's using and, and the number of cores, how long it was in the queue and then when that happened. You can find other things out about those jobs. And use commands like this to determine basically um, you know, what, what the queue wait times are like and how that's affected by different properties of jobs. You can also sort based on the priority. Using this command sq-p and then sorting pi of the pending jobs to less actually lists the queue in the order 
that the scheduling cycles are using uh, to, to send jobs to the run state. And then finally what you want to do is if you're noticing that there's a long wait time, you might want to look at the actual properties of the cluster. Something like S control show partitions gives you a definition of the partitions on the system. Basically what nodes belong to what partition uh, and, and what the other properties of those partitions are. And then commands like S info less actually give you an overview of the system. And we can call that one here. where we actually see the different partitions, their availability, the, the time limits that are constraining those definitions, uh, the number of nodes that are in different states. This is where we're going to be uh, using properties in the system to determine how the partition should be realigned to match the types of jobs that are still waiting in the queue, probably, perhaps for longer than we Now, in terms of future directions, as the load on the systems balances out and continues to evolve, the scheduling configuration policy, policies, for example, the partition uh, definitions, will be adjusted to maximize both utilization and performance. Uh, as scheduling configuration properties settle to the workloads on the systems, the documentation of the scheduling policy at the scheduling policies page at docs.com.ca will become more and more detailed. But for now, using the slurm commands, you can keep an eye on, on, on how that's working. Now, we've talked a little bit about SSTAT and SAC to see the properties of a job, but there are also uh, job profiling tools such as Remora. Uh, they can be used to explore. Uh, uh, you can explore those in order to complement Slurm job monitoring tools for estimation of, uh, of the procedure's resource requirements. Now, this, this is important in that the resource requirements of your job determines the shape. The performance of your job is what we, we need researchers to be submitting at all costs. So in conclusion, jobs should be submitted with resource shapes that best match the optimal running of a procedure. So profiling your code, doing scaling tests to determine what the resource requests of a job should be. That's what should determine the shape of the job that you submit. On the configuration side, we're going to be making sure that the workloads that are coming into these general purpose systems all get a fair chance at beginning, regardless of how difficult some of the best performance shape jobs are to schedule. The configuration of the cluster and partitions, et cetera, will be adjusted to best suit the system workloads defined by user job shapes, maximizing both the utilization and the performance of individual jobs. Uh, we may have mentioned this a few times, but do not hesitate to open support tickets regarding job profiling, job resource shape, and queue properties by emailing us at support compute.canada.ca. The consultants and analysts here uh, have different specializations in getting certain code to perform better, including parallelization or vectorization. But it's very important, and in this presentation, we want to stress that the scheduler and the wait times is also a very important part of how the entire system runs that getting jobs to uh, maximize the utilization of the total system is an important property uh, and is an important property for the staff to discuss, to discuss with users uh, through the ticketing system and other avenues like this. And that concludes it. So thank you for your attention.